you would prepare us for a time of visitation with you, O oh God. Father, if there is anything in our mind, our heart, or spirit, Lord, that is sinful, or anything in us, O oh God, that would prevent the moving of the Holy Ghost, Lord, this is our time where we present ourselves to you, a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service. Father, as we present ourselves on that altar of repentance, Lord, we ask you that you would let the fires of the Holy Ghost consume upon the sacrifice, Lord. Burn away the dead things, O oh God. Burn away everything that is offensive to your spirit, O oh God. Lord, anything these eyes have seen today or anything these ears may have heard, Lord, any place where my mind may have wandered, Lord, any attitude or mentality or mindset that is in me that is in opposition to your word and to your eternal truth, Father, I lay it on your altar and I ask you that you would burn it to ashes. Lord, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your faithfulness, O oh God. You are faithful and just to forgive us, O oh Lord, of any transgression if we will but confess it. Lord Jesus, we thank you also for the word of God that is there to cleanse our hearts and minds, Lord. We pray that that would wash over us in this place, Lord. Renew us, O oh God, for the kingdom purpose. Father, as we as we enter into that holy place, Lord, as we are here for that time of visitation, Lord, we are asking that this service, Lord, would be a time of impartation. Father, we thank you for the word of God that's been prepared for us today. We pray that that word would shine in the darkness, oh God. Lord, reveal the things that we need to see in this hour. Reveal what the church should be for you in this hour. Lord Jesus, we thank you, oh God, for the men and women that have labored over the word of God in preparation for the service this evening, Lord, we ask you that you would anoint them, O oh God, as vessels of the Most High. Father, as they open their mouth to speak your word, we ask you that the man of God would have free course, Lord, and we pray that the word of God would have free course. Lord Jesus, let it shape and mold us, O oh God, according to your divine purpose. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you want to do in this place.
Oh, hallelujah, church, hallelujah. Do you know him to be good? Do you know him to be good? Has he been faithful to you? Hallelujah, Jesus. We magnify you, oh God. Bless the name of Jesus, church. Bless that holy name. The psalmist said in chapter 100, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. But then he goes on to say, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Is there anyone in the house that knows the Lord is truly good? Have you tasted of his mercy? And I am so thankful that his truth has endured to all generations, to us here on a Wednesday night in Pensacola, Florida. To all of our guests joining us in the house or online, we welcome you to First Pentecostal Church. We are delighted you have chosen this evening to worship with us. A few things going on uh, coming up soon. The first thing is immediately after service, to all parents, students, and chaperones that attend intend to uh, attend unity weekend immediately following service this evening please make your way upstairs to the upper room we will have a meeting for again students parents and chaperones for unity weekend and then turn to your neighbor and tell them baby dedication <laughs> it's coming up soon that's coming up on april the 28th during our a.m service right so if you would like to be a part or if you've not already signed up and you would like to participate, please do so on Realm or stop by the information desk. We'll get whatever information we need to make sure that you and your family can celebrate that new life that is now a part of your family. And if I could ask our ushers to please make their way forward as we prepare to give unto the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Church, I would ask that you would direct your attention to the prayer board behind me. These names represent needs. These names are family members, loved ones, co-workers, neighbors. But if you have a need, if you're in the house of the Lord tonight and you have a need, can you let that be represented by a lifting of your hand? If you have a loved one who is in need, everywhere we look, there are needs. But we know the God who knows these needs before we even ask. So church, let's ask in faith, believing that God will not only hear us when we pray, but he will answer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the presence and the spirit of the Lord that we already feel in this place. We thank you for the promise of your word that says, oh God, you know our needs before we even ask, Lord. But as an as a answer of faith, oh God, and as a way to build our trust and faith in you, we are asking you, oh Lord, to be in every situation that is represented on this prayer board and by every lifted hand by every man woman and child that is believing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you can truly do everything your word has declared to us so heal save deliver and redeem oh God we ask that you would bless this offering bless the word of the Lord this evening in Jesus name
Church, why don't you lift your hands, lift your voices. Give him praise tonight. Give Jesus praise. He's worthy to be praised. Do you find him to be holy? Do you find him to be wonderful? Worthy Jesus, worthy alone Jesus. Hallelujah, there's none like you. There's none like you, Jesus that compares to you. You are great. Greatly to be praised. Greatly to be lifted up and honored, exalted. Worthy of it all. Worthy of all praise. Hallelujah. Why don't you clap your hands and rejoice in the Lord. Again I say rejoice. For the Lord is good. He's worthy of all the praise. Why don't you turn to a few people tonight and greet them in Jesus' name and let them know that the Lord is good. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. And we give thanks unto the Lord for each and every one of you that are here tonight in person and online. Thank you for being a part of this service. We are so glad that you are here tonight, and we pray that you will hear the word of the Lord and what the Spirit is speaking unto the church in this hour. It is such a a good thing tonight to have with us that are going to speak our youth pastor and his wife. Sister Brittany is going to come here in just a moment, and then Brother Seth is going to follow right behind her. I believe they have a word for the church tonight. Why don't we do as the Bible declares, have an ear to hear what the Spirit will speak unto the church. God is doing great things in this hour. Before Sister Brittany comes, I just want to bring a prayer request to you. Uh, Brother Larry Anderson requested prayer. Many of you know Brother Larry. Why don't we lift our hands right now and pray a special healing touch upon him, Sister Alice Walters, Brother Aubrey Davidson. Let's pray for Brother Hartzell as well. You know all of these. We just prayed a moment ago, but I just feel in the Holy Ghost one more time to to bring a petition before the Lord for these brothers and sisters. God's able. Sister Barbara Mayall, the Lord is able. Every one of these needs, there's not an impossibility among them, but we serve a God that's able tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus. We come before you one more time, believing for our brother, believing for our sister, Lord, uh, that you can minister unto them, lift them up, Lord God, strengthen them and encourage them. In the name of the Lord Jesus, let your word go forth to heal, minister unto them tonight in the name of Jesus we pray in Jesus name amen church why don't you rejoice in the Lord sister Brittany why don't you come and deliver the word the Lord has given you praise the Lord church it's good to be in the house tonight amen y'all can go ahead and be seated I give all glory to God for this opportunity to be up here speaking to you tonight I can tell you that I should not be here, but it's only by the grace of God. Is there anybody else in the house tonight who's here by the grace of God? Amen. Amen. Uh, I wanna give honor to Pastor and Sister Kinsey and to Brother Daniel and Sister Dana. You know, I will never stop saying it, but we are infinitely blessed with the most loving leaders. They are a true reflection of Christ 
and his love and his mercy. And I'm just so very thankful for them. I also wanna give honor to my husband. He is my best friend and I wouldn't wanna do ministry with anybody else. And I'm just gonna be myself tonight because that's the only person I can be. Is that all right? Originally published in 1915, Robert Frost penned a timeless masterpiece titled The Road Not Taken. And perhaps there are a few of you who have heard it before. The poem starts off painting a simple image of something we can all relate to, and that is the dilemma of choice. It starts off, two roads diverged in a wood. You see, every day we are presented with choices. Researchers at Cornell University estimate that we make 226.7 decisions each day on food alone. I don't know, that kind of sounds like me, maybe. But it, and it's also estimated that the average adult makes about 35,000 remotely conscious decisions each day. And as we know, each choice we make carries certain consequences. If you choose to study for an exam, young people, you'll probably get a better grade. If you choose to go to the gym every day, you'll probably get stronger. And if you choose to have a cup of coffee in the morning, you'll probably be a happier person. <laughs> Amen. We all have choices. God has bestowed upon us the power of free will, and with that comes along the power to choose. I wanna to talk to you tonight about the choice a young shepherd boy had to make when he was confronted with a mad king. And I don't wanna assume that everybody in this room knows the story, so if you do, just listen along. Somewhere in the hills of Bethlehem, there was a boy. He was a shepherd boy, and every day he would keep his father's sheep, and he would sing and play songs on his harp. All the young shepherdesses thought that he was the cutest boy this side of the valley. You know, and he was pretty good at singing around stones, and even on occasion, he would fight a lion and a bear. But no one really knew about that. He was always the last boy to be picked for his tribe's kickball team, and so it really wasn't any surprise to David when he found himself as the last brother, brother to walk up to the sacrifice where the prophet Samuel was. But you might can imagine his shock when the mighty man of God begins to hold this very large horn of oil over his head. I am pretty sure this is not how he expected his afternoon to go. Him chosen to lead his people, what could he do but feed some sheep, sling a few stones, and play his harp? Now, at this point, Saul was the current standing king. And when the children of Israel whined and complained that they just had to be like all the other nations around them, it was Saul, whom the Bible describes as a good and pleasant young man who, would take, who, was set to, who was set in place to rule the Lord's people. Saul's reign would not continue, however, because it did not matter that Saul was a good and pleasant young man or that he had a new heart or that he had served in an anointed position. It was Saul's outright disobedience to the word of the Lord that started the descent of his downfall. And so the Lord takes away the kingdom from Saul, and David, the ruddy shepherd boy, is anointed the next king. And the Bible says that from that moment, the spirit of the Lord came upon David, but it departed from Saul. Now tormented by an evil, dist distressing spirit from the Lord, Saul finds himself seeking counsel from his advisors. When one of them recommends that a heart player be brought forth to soothe the spirit away, David finds himself in the service of the very man he was chosen to replace. And in the beginning, everything was great. The sun was shining and the birds were singing and there was peace in the courts and Saul loved David. And he singled him out among all the rest to be his armor bearer. Most of us do know the events that take place next. David fights Goliath, and on his way home, the women begin to sing. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And this was the straw that broke the camel's back. And from that moment on, David was Saul's enemy. 
1 Samuel 18, 10 through 11, and it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied in his house. So David played music with his hand as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. I wanna talk to you for the next few moments about the ways of a harp player. How many of us in this room have ever had a hard time doing what you are told? I'll be the first to raise my hand, and I will also raise my hand for my four-year-old, who when asked to do something like clean his room, you know, something as simple as that, uh, he usually moves at his own pace, which is uh, the pace of a sloth riding on the back of a turtle in a puddle of molasses. Any other parents can agree to that. Sometimes it's just hard for us to obey, but here we find David picking up his heart, harp one more time to sing and to play, not to his father's sheep, where it was quiet and comfortable and easy, but to a king who slept with a spear in his hand. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm 100% positive that I would not have stepped a single foot into Saul's house that day because I'm not going anywhere near anyone who has tried to kill me. Fool me once, shame on me. But fool me, no, I got that backwards. (laughs) Fool me once, shame on you. (laughs) Fool me twice, that's shame on me. But David did, did. Why, how could he do this? Why would he willingly comfort a man who put a target on his back? Simply put, David could do this because for one, David was a heart player. And heart players are submitted. They are obedient. You see, it was this act of service that was David's ministry. Playing his harp was what David was called to do during this season of his life. Now, I think given his friendship with Jonathan, I feel like David probably could have worked out a better arrangement than to end back up within those walls. But David was obedient to the will and to the plan that God had ordered for his life. Now you might say, "Um, but the Lord never specifically told David uh, to do that. You know, I think it would have just been okay if he opted out. You know, like it's a text chain that you no longer want to receive. I'm just going to opt out of this, Lord. Or you might say, you know, don't you know that David was called to be king? He shouldn't have to be subjected to this. But David was submitted to the process. He would never be king or fulfill his calling without first being a heart player. In Acts 13, 22, scripture says, and when he had removed him, talking about Saul, he raised up for them David as king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. David was going to do the will of the Lord. It did not matter if David felt like it or not. If you're going to be in ministry, and just remember, that's everyone. Somebody say, that's me. Lesson one, it's not about you. Sometimes this is a hard thing for us. You know, we're so easily controlled by our emotions and our feelings that it can hinder us from obeying God. But in arriving at Saul's house that day with his hands on his heart, he was saying, I am here to serve, and it's not about me. You see, the Spirit of the Lord now dwelt with David, and so it was his responsibility to bring heaven down. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11, 26 through 28, behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Obedience is a choice. David understood if he wanted the blessings and not cursings, he was going to obey. He was going to be submitted. He would not step out of alignment when things got hard or uncomfortable because this was the way of a heart player. During Risen one night, we were walking into practice and Lachlan, my four-year-old, he makes this statement. He says, I hate Roman soldiers. I'm not looking at any of you in particular, Brother Dustin. (laughs) And so I'm like, okay, this is a great, this is a great teaching moment. And say, Lachlan, did you know that Jesus loves Roman soldiers? 
And I said, did you know that when the mean Roman soldiers put Jesus on the cross, I said, do you know what he did? I said, he forgave them. Now, you know, expecting a lot from my four-year-old in this little conversation, I asked him, I said, so when people are mean to you, what do you do? And without missing a beat, he says, we fight back. I tried, but for some of us, it is our human nature to want to fight back, to pick up a spear, but when, when David's fight or flight response started going off, David chose to flee. Now think about that for a moment. David was a warrior. He fought battles, and he had slain his tens of thousands, but he had to overcome his fleshly nature and submit to the will of the Lord in order to be obedient. Now, the Bible tells us that David was called a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14, but now thy kingdom shall not continue, talking to Saul. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. The Hebrew word used for heart in this verse it refers to the inner man. You see, from this inner man, it is the source of all that we do. It is our thoughts and our desires, words, actions, and emotions. They all flow from these steps. It's this inner man that we cannot see. But this is what the Lord sees, and this is what the Lord seeks. The same word is used throughout the book of Deuteronomy. In chapter 10, verse 12, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God? to walk in all of his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart. That's the inner man. David was a man after God's own heart because David's inner man was in alignment with God's heart. Charles Spurgeon once said that some of your hearts are not worth keeping. How true is this statement? We know that our hearts are deceitful and they are wicked and that we cannot know it. But, Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You see, it is the word of God that can discern the inner man. Later in his life, this is why we see David praying, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. And this is why he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I can assure you that it was not David's own heart that chose to be a heart player that day. But this is what God has always desired from his people, that we would have his heart. And this is why daily we must go to the altar in repentance and why we need to be washed by the water of his word. You see, there will be many times in life when we are presented with opportunities where we will have to make a choice about how we will respond. So maybe there are some of you tonight who are up against your own spear throwers. Maybe it's a coworker, a boss, a family member, or a friend. Maybe they have lied to you or hurt you mistreated you, or they're just out to get you. Just remember that heart players cannot be spear throwers. You see, you cannot hold both instruments in your hands at the same time. But your words and your actions will reflect which instrument you choose to hold. The harp was an instrument used in worship, but the spear was used in the midst of war. The harp was used for healing, but the spear was used for hurt. The harp could refresh, but the spear could ruin. So how can we know if we are harp players or spear throwers? Well, are you quick to lash out with your words, or do you have a blessing tongue? Are you quick to judge, or do you opt to show mercy? Are you selfish with your time, or do you give it freely to the kingdom and those in need? What would have happened if David picked up the spear like Saul? You know, I'm sure no one would have faulted him for trying to do away with the mad king who was trying to kill him. But David couldn't do it. It was not the way of a heart player. Even when he had the opportunity presented to him, he could not do it. You see, if at any point David picked up a spear, he would have ended up just like Saul. His future would have been ruined, and he would have never become a king. He would have never fulfilled his God-ordained potential. God is always seeking those who will operate in the ways 
of a heart player. Those who are obedient to his word, those who have a clean heart. And in closing, let me just encourage you tonight, when you are presented with the dilemma of choice, choose the way of a heart player. Hallelujah. Why don't we give God a hand clap of praise? I, I told her she could have my 15 minutes, but she, um, she politely declined. Um, but no, awesome job, honey. Didn't she do a great job tonight? Um, if you have your Bibles, Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And while you're turning there, I would like to give honor to Pastor and Sister Kinsey, Brother and Sister Strobel. Don't we have the best leadership that anyone could ever ask for? So thankful for Pastor and Sister Kinsey, Brother and Sister Strobel. Brother Strobel loves my phone calls. He loves my 9 o'clock p.m. phone calls, my afternoon phone calls. He just loves them so much, but also... I'd like to give, he's not saying anything back. Name again and amen. I also want to give honor to my wife. Um, I could not do ministry without her. I jokingly tell her all the time, she should really just write my messages and I could deliver them, that she's the real youth pastor. I'm just kind of the front guy, um, but I give her honor. So Hosea chapter two, verses 14 through 15. Therefore, behold, this is the Lord speaking I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her vineyards from thence and from the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And you may be seated. The wilderness is not a destination vacation for most people. Now, I do have some people on my youth staff who... Maybe kind of strange, like they enjoy going out and, and being in the wilderness. I love you, Brother Wyatt and Sister Chloe, but um, most people, and I know there's a few more wilderness enthusiasts in the room, but most people do not choose the wilderness for vacation. Often times, if you are uh, depressed, you don't go to the wilderness looking for encouragement. Most people would never ever associate the wilderness even with a place of provision. Instead, we often, when we think of wilderness, we think of lack, we think of pain, we think of discomfort, discouragement, hopelessness. We, we often do everything we can to avoid such things. People turn to entertainment, work, we busy ourselves, we get so busy that we don't have time to actually deal with the problem and deal with the wilderness. But the truth is, we'll all come to a time in our lives when we are in the wilderness. There will come a time in our lives when nothing we do seems to help. We pray and nothing seems to change. We come to church, but we still cannot see the borders of the promised land. We write everything down that we're thankful for, yet we can't shake that depression. We speak in tongues, we read our Bible, we dance, we shout, we praise, but our wilderness doesn't change. We often become disheartened in believing that it will always be this way, that the situation will never get better. I will always be depressed. I will always have anxiety. I will always be sick. I will never get ahead. It's the wilderness, the place we all try to avoid, yet it finds us all, because none of us are, ex are exempt from the wilderness. I want to talk to you for just a few moments on the thought, words in the wilderness, words in the wilderness. So Hagar knew all about the wilderness. It was not her choice to bear Abram, Abram's first child, Ishmael. She was truly a product of her circumstance. She did not choose this, but instead the choice was made for her, and Hagar was treated badly by Sarai even after she obeyed because Sarai underestimated the power of her own jealousy. So Hagar flees from Sarai, and she finds herself in a wilderness due to the choices of other people. And how many of us, we have found ourselves in a wilderness because of what other people have done to us, what other people have said to us, words that were spoken that should never have been spoken, people that should have been there, yet they walked out on us. We, we seem to make progress. We seem to be moving forward. But then all of a sudden, something happens in our life, and we're taken right back to that moment, and we relive the pain as if it is fresh 
and happening all over again. It's a wilderness that you did not choose to be in. You are suffering because of the choices of other people. And no matter what you do, the pain does not go away. The person does not apologize. The damage has been done. And this is where Hagar had found herself. Because in Genesis 16, 4 through 6, and he, speaking of Abram, went on to Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, my wrong be upon thee. I have given my maiden into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly or harshly with her, she fled from her face. Now Hagar is, actually, is not completely innocent in this because when Hagar conceived, she let Sarai know, I am blessed and you are not. She let Sarai know, I am the servant, yet I now have more than you. I am blessed by God. She actually allowed her blessing to become a source of pride. But Sarai, instead of picking up a harp, as my wife talked about, she picked up a spear and she fought fire with fire and she began to treat Hagar so harshly that Hagar runs to the wilderness with child. She's alone. And this looks like the end for Hagar of all the times to run to a wilderness when you're expecting a child probably would not be the best time. Why does she do this? Because it's easier to run away from Sarai than to be reconciled with her. And to make the situation worse, Abram, the father of the unborn child, you would think he would show interest. This is supposedly what he believes his child of promise, yet Abram says, whatever happens, happens. It, it doesn't matter to me. So Hagar, Hagar truly feels forsaken. The people that should have cared did not care. The people that should have been there were not there. So what, what happens? In Genesis 16 and 7, the Bible says, the angel of the Lord found her by the fountain of water, in the wilderness, by the fountain, in the way of sure. You see, when no one else saw Hagar, God saw Hagar. And I don't know what your wilderness is or why you're in your wilderness, but I want to remind you tonight that God still sees you in your wilderness. He sees the financial pain. He sees the doctor's diagnosis. He sees the emotional pain. God sees you. He has not forsaken you because your wilderness cannot hide you from God. God sees you. When God sees you, that's all that matters. Because Job even said, I can't see him on my left. I cannot see him on my right. I can't perceive him behind me or in front of me. But God knows the path that I take. And even when I don't feel him, even when I talk to him and I don't think he hears me, God still knows where I am. But God comes back and God has some tough instructions for Hagar in Genesis 16 and 9. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, return to thy mistress, submit thyself under her hands. He said, Hagar, you have to go back. You cannot stay in your wilderness. You cannot give up. Even though Sarai hurt you, Hagar, running into the wilderness, isolating yourself, running away, giving up is not the answer. He says, you have to go back, Hagar. You have to humble yourself and submit to Sarai. But why, God? Wouldn't it be easier to stay in the wilderness than to deal with the pain? Wouldn't it be easier to ignore the problem than to confront the problem and receive healing? Wouldn't it be easier to stay in a state of bitterness than to forgive and be vulnerable? But Hagar, you can't stay in the wilderness. Why? Why can't you stay in the wilderness, Hagar? Because, Hagar, you're carrying a promise. Genesis 16, 10 through 11. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed, and it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, But thou art, behold, thou art with child, and thou shalt bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. Hagar, if you stay in your wilderness, then your promise will die in the wilderness with you. You have a promise from God and you cannot allow your wilderness to kill your promise. 
Because there is a promise inside of you. And don't let any wilderness keep you from bringing it forth. Don't let there be any excuse that keeps you from moving forward. Don't let there be any pain that keeps you from receiving healing. Don't let there be any voice of the enemy that keeps you from hearing the voice of God. Because Hagar, you have a promise inside of you. Don't let the unforgiveness stop the healing. Don't let the confusion steal your trust from God. Don't let your discouragement steal your faith. I know you've brought that request to God many times and I know it feels like it will never be answered, but I say, pray again. I say, pray again, why? Why do we pray again? Because the Bible says you shall name him Ishmael, which means God will here. And I don't know where you're at right now. You may feel like Job, but God will heal your, hear your cry even in the wilderness. So don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. Keep coming to the house of God. Keep hearing the word of God, reading the word of God, because God will hear you even in your wilderness. God he sees every tear. He hears every cry. When you got up this morning and you prayed and you felt like it didn't get past the ceiling, God heard every word. Because God sees you in the wilderness, but God also hears you in the wilderness. But the amazing thing about this is God will also speak to you in the wilderness. Because the, there's something about a wilderness that opens our ears to God. Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 3. And thou remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doeth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doeth man live. In other words, Israel, it was not the manna that sustained you. It was the word of God. It was not all the things you thought you needed that sustained you. It was the word of God. When everything else failed you, when your friends and your family failed you, when this and that failed you, the word of God sustained you. Maybe you're like the lady with the issue of blood. You've tried it all, but it fails. There's that one thing that will never fail and it's the word of God. Why? Why? Because the word of God can make provision appear even in the wilderness. Israel did not have to, Israel was not in the promised land. They didn't have the milk and the honey, but in the wilderness, God made provision appear because his word supersedes the wilderness. His word supersedes your situation. His word supersedes your emotional state. His word supersedes whatever you're going through. The wilderness So Hagar, it looks like you have no hope. And it may look like you have no future, that this is the end of you. But remember, you have a word from God and the wilderness does not hinder God's ability to speak in your life because God sees you in the wilderness. He hears you in the wilderness and he speaks to you in the wilderness. Going back to our opening text, Hosea 2 and 4. Therefore, behold, I will allure her... <coughs> Excuse me, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Israel at this point had been judged or they were about to be judged by God, by God for her constant backsliding. It had finally caught up with Israel. And she had brought this wilderness unto herself, kind of like Hagar. Hagar was partially innocent, but really not. Israel had no excuse. This, is, this wilderness was all on her. But the thing about God is this. He can use the wildernesses of our own making for our good. Now, you may still deal with the consequences of your choices, but God has a way of bringing restoration even in the wilderness. God told Hosea, he said, I will bring Israel into the wilderness because some of our, no one likes to think about this, but some of our wildernesses are God-ordained. Not everything is the devil. Because as long as we're comfortable, as long as we're too busy to ignore the problem, we drown out the voice of God. So God draws us into the wilderness to get rid of every distraction so he can speak into our lives. 
The Bible even says that when Jesus came up out of baptism, straight away the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. There's something about the wilderness that reminds us of what truly matters in life. Hosea 2 and 15, this is what God said he would do. I will give her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. From the wilderness, God said, I will give her vineyards. While she's in her wilderness, while she's struggling to make it, at that point, I will restore the vineyards because your wilderness does not have to change for God to bless you. God can bless you in the middle of your mess. You don't have to have it all together before God will bring restoration in your life because even in the wilderness, God can give you vineyards. And, and I'm closing, you can stand. One translation, this is the NLT, this is verse 15. I will return her vineyards to her and transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. And she will give herself to me there, she did long ago when she was young, when I freed her from her captivity in Egypt. See, what used to be a valley of trouble, what used to be that thing that tripped you up all the time, that emotional valley you always found yourself in. God said, I'm going to change that into a gateway of hope. And I don't know what your valley of trouble is. I don't know the pain that's in your past. I don't know the thing that's always tripped you up, the thing that maybe everyone in your family has messed up and struggled with. But God says, I'm gonna change that valley of trouble and I'm gonna change it into a gateway of hope. Because God has the ability to change our tragedy into triumph. And what used to hinder you will become the very thing that God uses you to, uses to propel you into your destiny. Because God sees you. God hears you. God speaks to you. And God will even restore you in the middle of your wilderness. So I, I don't know what your struggle is tonight. I don't know what you're going through. And I, I, don't, I don't know what you're battling. And some of it is truly severe. There's stories in this room. There's testimonies in here of people who have gone through trauma, who have gone through severe things. But I'm here to tell you, God wants to change your wilderness. He wants to change your valley of trouble. He wants to change it into a gateway of hope. And not just for you, but he wants to change it so you can impact other people. He wants to use you to reach other people. So when they look at you and they're in their valley of trouble, they look at you and instead of seeing trouble, they see a gateway of hope. So these altars are open tonight. I invite you to come. If you just need to talk to God, if you just need God to speak to you, maybe you're like Hagar and you feel like no one hears you and no one sees you and no one knows where you're at. Just want to remind you that God sees you. God hears you. God hears the cry. That single mom, that single dad, God hears the cry. That parent praying for a prodigal, God hears and sees the cry of you praying for over that diagnosis. God knows what's going on. God, God knows what you're going through. And I believe that God wants to minister tonight. I believe God. I believe God is reaching for people and letting you know. I know you feel like giving up. I know you feel like you're in a valley of trouble. But my spirit can change your trouble. If you'll go back and submit, if you'll be reconciled, I'll change your valley of trouble. I'll change it into a door of hope. So why don't we cry out to God for the next few minutes and God help us. Lord, help us to be who you want us to be. God, bring healing to your people, Lord.